in speaking about races, uh, I want to bring up, if I could, the two gubernatorial candidates for California. We flip the coin to see who will go first. We don't want anybody fighting. <laughs> so, and Josh watched it so he can say that he, it's his fault if you get mad. So, the first person I'm going to bring up here is someone who actually uh, I met here in California. I actually met here in California at a Jeff Hewitt event. Where's Jeff? The man himself right there, yes. Absolutely, Jeff. The man himself. Absolutely. Are you ready for a few seconds? Nicholas Walsock. How's everyone doing this evening? How you doing? Welcome to California. <laughs> if you're visiting from out of town and don't know who I am, I am Nicholas Wildstar, the Libertarian candidate for California governor. Um, I am also known by many people as the rap artist Q-Ball. <laughs> I moved out here from Wisconsin to pursue a career in music and am known as the rap artist Q-Ball. My first album is on Pandora and iTunes and Spotify and I even have a, mo a song in the movie be scary movie four. So I've uh, accomplished quite a lot as an underground musician and have been fighting for the for the smaller people, for the um, for the underdog. And that's been my message to voters is to let them know that they must stay adamant, must stay strong and continue to fight for the greater cause. I've um, also known very well amongst the community as Governor Wildstar. <laughs> I have been very activism for the past 10 years as an anonymous activist and was involved, involved in the Occupy Wall Street movement when that first uh, picked up steam here in California and have been involved in marches and rallies throughout the state and um, I also had to have paid the bills for the past you know 20 years that I've lived out here in California so I've worked in project management, I've worked in debt management, I've worked in customer relations and uh, as a 20 year working class professional it definitely is a resume to the people to let them know that I'm just like you. I'm a working class citizen that works hard to pay their bills, to pay their taxes and to make a, a, a life for themselves. So. Um, right now, I've been working full time on my campaign and have been touring throughout the state and it's been extremely rewarding. I know a, a lot of candidates, they take for granted the ground game, uh, meeting people face to face, but it's been ex extremely rewarding for me because it's given me an opportunity to connect with people one on one and where I introduce myself as a candidate, a gubernatorial candidate, and they don't even have a clue who any of the other candidates are, that automatically gives me an advantage because now I'm putting a face to the name that they're going to see on the ballot. And it also gives me an opportunity to relate with them one-on-one -on -one and find out what issues affects them the most. Um, while these other candidates are taking advantage of photo ops and, you know, control scenes where they're going into the inner cities and meeting with people, I'm going in there bare bare knuckled, <laughs> no no cameras, no pictures, no none of that. I actually went to San, uh, Sacramento after the Stephon Clark shooting where Sacramento police officers had killed a 22 year old black male for holding a cell phone in his hand. So um, his family was pretty much cast into the limelight and were demanded to be spokesmen for something, for a tragedy when um, that's a very difficult position for any of us to do. Not many of us have lost a loved one or let alone two children. The mother had lost two of her young sons and the brother had lost two of his little brothers. And um, this was a young man that, like most of us, is trying to find his way in life and is in an environment where that is difficult, it's restricted. And one of the first few things that I asked him when I met him was, are you registered to vote? Because as much as we want to hold the police accountable and the district attorney accountable and every other representative that's been involved with this accountable, the only way that we're ever going to be able to make effective change is if we register to vote. So I'm letting people know out there to vote libertarian if they want to bring a permanent solution to all of these problems that are going on in our cities 
that are happening in our states and that are preventing people from being able to prosper as they would love to. Let's make this Golden State go. Yes. Thank you. Next candidate I actually uh, met at Freedom Fest last year. And I walked up to him and I knew him and he knew me. So it was nice. We never met each other. We just see each other on, on uh, social media. That awesome, uh, what we both love and hate social media. But yes, that actually helped us tremendously to actually know each other. This is uh, Zoltan Ishvan. Hello everyone and welcome to uh, California. My name is Zoltan Ishvan and uh, actually uh, it's almost to the date that I've been running for uh, California governor as a libertarian for 18 months now. And it's been, it's been an exciting uh, campaign full of a lot of, uh, a lot of challenges and a lot of different things. Some of you know me um, as a science and technology person. Uh, I'm a bit of a public figure in that uh, area. And that doesn't always work that well with libertarianism, but I have been trying my best over the last 18 months to convince uh, not only the Libertarian Party, but also the Libertarian Movement that this party can gain a foothold in the American political realm by using science and technology, by being at the forefront of some of the greater visions that we have as a party and beating the Republicans and Democrats. So in many ways, that's what my campaign has been about. That said, I hope you'll come to the governor's um, debate tomorrow, the gubernatorial debate, because I think one thing that has been happening is that a lot of the libertarians, and when I meet and walk around you, don't realize that I have a ton of normal libertarian views outside of my uh, public personality that deals with science and technology all the time. And I'd like to share them. I share them all the time when I'm on the campaign trail. I share them all the time in interviews. I share them all the time in media. They just don't always get out that much because, um, Frankly, when you're a public figure in the science and technology world, people really want to hear mostly your science and technology views. But a little bit about me, um, I'm an Ivy League graduate, I'm a former National Geographic journalist, I'm a successful entrepreneur, I did really well in my 30s, enough so I haven't had to work for about 10 years and hopefully won't have to again. I was in real estate, doing real estate development and still have properties around the world. Some of you came to know me because I interviewed um, with Gary Johnson to be his preferred uh, vice presidential running mate. I didn't get the job, obviously, but um, I did get involved with the Libertarian Party through Gary Johnson, and I've been uh, very proud of that. I've been very excited to uh, be a part here, and um, I am running for governor. I'm hoping that I'm making a dent uh, in the media. So one of the things that has been happening with my campaign is, as a lot of people know, it gets a, a huge amount of attention. I try my best to combine a lot of the different types of ideas that media wants to cover me with, usually science and technology, with libertarian views. It can be anything from ABC Nightline, The Times of London, The Big Thing. Um, we've had other major things. The LA Times has covered me. Many different stories have come out, and I understand that a lot of them do talk about science and technology, but understand that it's important that as a gubernatorial candidate, somebody tries to push the boundaries. And I've been trying to do that with my campaign. And I know that we, you know, we're about 50 to 70 million views now in my personal camp, gubernatorial campaign for the Libertarian Party in recognition. I'm, I'm assuming that's probably the most of any of the, the candidates in any race in 2018. I know it's not always the kind of coverage that people want because it talks about science and technology. But in the end of the day, it comes right back to the Libertarian campaign that I'm running. And I hope if you come tomorrow to the gubernatorial debate, you'll hear some of the other views that I have that aren't just about science and technology, but strictly about my libertarian policies, reducing taxes, fighting the drug war, the basic things that the LP stands for, which I also stand for. So thank you so much, and uh, welcome to California. Zoltan mentioned trying to become the VP and not getting it. And I kind of know that feeling. <laughs> I'm with you on that one. Uh, so yes, uh, the next person I'll bring up is a fellow New Yorker. Um, not actually a, not a current New Yorker. Though. The interesting thing about New York City, it's a very interesting city. Some of you may not know this. About 30% of all people who live in New York City weren't born in the country. About another 30% weren't born in New York City. So a very common thing we say in New York City is where you're from. We assume you're not from New York City. 
<laughs> most people who are in New York City, they move out of the city. They move, actually, you may not know this, down to the Carolinas or Florida. So many New Yorkers move to the Carolinas, they have a name for us in the Carolinas. They call us halfbacks. We move to Florida, then halfway back. <laughs> so the gentleman I bring him now, he lives not right now in Brooklyn. I live in Queens and he lives in Brooklyn. And if you know New York City, those two, bo those two boroughs actually border each other. And there's no way to get there. <laughs> the only way to get to either one is through Manhattan. So we're probably 10 miles away and that's about two hours in New York time. It's insane. But this man, I met him uh, about two years ago, give or take. I think about two years ago I met him. I see him whenever I get a chance. He is the editor at large for Reason Magazine, Matt Welch. Thank you, Larry. Um, uh, even though I would love to one day go to a Libertarian Party State Convention where you're not there. Um, does, that, does that happen? Never. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's awesome to be here for a lot of reasons. One is just Ed Clark. Are you kidding? That's yeah, really? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, California is my hometown, and to be in front of a bunch of libertarians, not just the California is my hometown. Long Beach is my hometown. I can walk to the house where I was birthed. My dad lives down the street. I remember when this hotel opened. It was a huge deal. We got a fancy hotel. All we had was like little, you know when they talk about the East Side Motel? That, that's that's around uh, here. That's all we had. We didn't have a fancy hotel. It was, a, it was gigantic. If you'd have told me in 1987 when this thing opened and I just graduated from high school that I would yeah, at some point be here talking to a bunch of Libertarian, you know, the Libertarian Party. I would have said, "What's a Libertarian?" Probably. Yeah. <laughs> uh, unlike everybody else so far that has spoken, I am not a member of the party. Don't hate on me for this. Um, I've just never belonged to any kind of party. Um, I feel like whenever I'm with a bunch of Libertarians, I spend a lot of time, like capital Libertarians, I spend a lot of time apologizing um, to Nick uh, Sarwark personally. Um, <laughs> he sends me a direct message about once every four or five months. Uh, this is basically not helping Matt. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, for various, you know, I, I, I go out there and I spend a lot of time in the media talking about Libertarian ideas and things like that. And, and ultimately, you know, I. Uh, yeah, I, I fall short of the Kokeshian ideal of, uh, of uh, any given uh, issue. And, uh, uh, so, since I'm home now, here, and I was driving around my old uh, neighborhood, I realized I had some confessions to make to you uh, quickly before I hand off the baton. Um, one is that my first job was for the local city government. Uh, here in New York. Okay. But it was the city of Lakewood. Contract City, right? The first contract city in America. So, uh, Parks and Recreation uh, Department uh, there. And also, I was, I, I'd only, I remembered this as I was driving down Lakewood Boulevard. I was uh, from Lakewood Village, just over there, uh, about a mile or so away. Um, and went by a place called the Village uh, uh, Dental or Village Dentistry. It used to be a uh, uh, topless uh, strip club. And, uh, and when they went bottomless in about 1976, uh, a local uh, uh, activist uh, lady wanted uh, to have the kids pass out flyers door to door saying this has just gone too far. Um, and even though it went against my personal uh, opinions at the time, being eight years old and knowing where the hole was to look through in this place, uh, well, my, now that you could see anything, it was just like a hole and you could pretend that you were saying something and you're being all tough, um, I did take uh, money from that because I wanted the money uh, and pass out flyers uh, against this. Um, Janine was talking about uh, persuasion uh, and, and the way that we kind of present our ideas out there. And I think it's kind of the big topic on some level, regardless of whether you're working directly in politics or working in activism and movement and everything. And I just wanted to hit you with one idea about all of that that's uh, pertinent this week. Last week, I uh, had the uh, incredible opportunity to meet Suzette Kilo. Suzette Kilo is part of the reason why I finally, even after working for Reason for a while, finally said, okay, I'm a libertarian. Uh, when Nick Gillespie first hired me, he asked me to describe my political views, and I was such a special flower that I came up with some contorted, well, I'm like a Central European liberal, um, didn't make any sense. But after the Kilo decision, the Rach decision, the mid-aughts, mid drove me nuts, and also working for um, the Los Angeles Times uh, at that time, and seeing how like the civic sausage is made, nothing will turn you more into a libertarian than seeing uh, how people just 
suffer from this kind of groupthink about what we can do to people, in this case, famously stealing the home of someone because she was insufficiently rich. Uh, outrageous. So anyways, I met Suzette Kilo last week. She's great, by the way. She's a total ball buster. She will drink you under the table. Very funny. But the, uh, the occasion was the opening of Little Pink House. Uh, have you all heard about this movie? Yes. Yes. So, Little Pink House. The website is Little Pink House, the movie. Go click on that website because it will show where it's playing. It's um, uh, directed and written by Courtney Moorhead Balaker, Ted Balaker, who used to work at Reason um, and graduated from UC Irvine, I, uh, I uh, learned just today here um, uh, from one of his uh, former classmates. Um, uh, it, uh, uh, it came out this past weekend. It was the fourth highest per screen box office of any movie in the country last weekend in its opening weekend. They went to New London, Connecticut. They, they, they uh, had a screening in a theater there, an old historic theater, with 1,400 seats. It sold out. They had to like, turn people away at the door. Oh, wow. uh, and it's, uh, it's amazing. It's a very, very good movie. I mean, it's not just like, oh, a friend of mine made a movie and i got to pretend I like it. It's actually really, really good and subtle on the relationship uh, level. Um, you can help, and it's actually for all of you running, and that's, I think, half of this room is running for something in California, it seems like. Um, this can be useful, because when you get, you can go on the website, click on the link, and you can, it talks about if you get enough uh, like signatures, you can get that movie playing in the local house. Who do you think shows up at those movies? Right? Who's psyched to go see Ted and Courtney talk about it in Pasadena or in Irvine, I think they're doing this sometime soon. San Diego's another showing. But if you can get enough people to uh, sign up for it and organize a screening there, the people who show there are the people who are going to donate to your damn campaign and who are also going to vote for you and who are also just kind of good people anyway. Um, and, and it tells you a message that I think libertarians, especially all of us who kind of come from an engineering nerd uh, background, uh, need to always be thinking about, which is the, there's a lot of different ways to connect with people in this world, including the majority of people who are not very political, human stories, human individual outrage stories that you can sink your teeth and fingers into and understand on a very basic level. That connects with people in a way that's, that has, it's not a policy paper. It's a human uh, story. It's, uh, it's, it's a, we should always be reminding our, ourselves of that as we go and try to make positive political change. Thank you. I'm looking forward to talking to you. All right, thank you so much, Matt. I appreciate everybody coming today. You know, what he says is important. We often talk about theory and concept, but when you have like a little pink house, that makes the one thing real, right? Uh, I'm a libertarian, I'm gonna quote Stalin right now. Yep, Stalin. Uh, one death is a tragedy, a million is a stat. And that's true. We can talk about eminent domain all we want to and how bad it is, how evil it is, but when it's one individual thing, all of a sudden now it becomes real. I like us all as we're out there talking about those issues. Remember, try to have an anecdote, try to have a story, try to make those big issues we talk about, try to make them real. One more thing, support your local parties and support the California party, ca.lp.org. Have a good night. Thank you to YouTube for hosting this video and for being an essential part of human progress by making video hosting available worldwide to everyone on the internet. However, the next phase in human progress is here with Steemit.com and their video hosting alternative blockchain-based solutions, including DTube, and you can find that through Steemit.com as well as my own page there, at Adam Kokesh. This is a decentralized blockchain-based social media network that pays you fairly for your content. Already, I'm regularly making more there with a single post than I do from an entire month on YouTube. So please join us on the next frontier of the information revolution at steamit.com. And if you want help getting a leg up there, I'm happy to re-steam your posts and make sure that no one is starting from scratch. Just email me one of your favorite posts at adam at and we'll share it on my feed.